The television image and voice of Charlene Hunter Galt are familiar to almost everyone in our audience this afternoon. She has spent the last 25 years engaged in serious television news reportage. For 20 years, Charlene Hunter Galt was a national correspondent for national for the McNeil Lair News Hour. In 1997, she moved to South Africa, and a year later joined CNN's Internet, CNN International as bureau chief in Johannesburg. Reporting on Southern Africa is a critical and demanding role for a broadcast journalist, where Charlene had to compete for airtime with events in other regions of the world that, at times, seem to overwhelm us and dominate broadcast news reports. In a recent interview with World Press Review, she described the particular challenge in covering Southern Africa. It's a case of constantly advocating for Africa, which is not to say that the position is specifically pro-African, but of course one wants to get as many Africa stories on the air as possible. CNN International has been very receptive to us. I'm hoping for more exposure on domestic CNN. It's especially important for Americans to get an international perspective at this critical period in our history. There is a direct correlation between poverty and security, she said. The condition of Africa makes it ripe for activity by terrorists. Poverty is a real threat to security, and the lack of understanding of that, especially by Westerners, is frightening. Negotiating for credentials in some African countries can be a complex undertaking for journalists from Western news organizations. CNN is banned in Zimbabwe, where Charlene wanted to report on how its people were surviving with food shortages. So she managed to get accredited to cover World Cup cricket tournament in Harare. I know nothing about cricket, she confessed to an interviewer, so she stopped at the cricket ground long enough to see an opening match and then went on to do other stories. One that received wide attention was on efforts by other African leaders to negotiate the political deadlock in Zimbabwe. She reported on informed speculation suggesting that an interim political settlement with a transitional government that would set the stage for a graceful exit for Zimbabwe's president, Robert Mugabe. Charlene's first work as a journalist was at The New Yorker, where she wrote items for the magazine's Talk of the Town section. In 1968, she joined The New York Times, where the focus of her work was on the urban black community. During 10 years at the paper, she received many awards, including the National Urban Coalition Award for Distinguished Urban Reporting. Over 25 years as a broadcast news journalist, Charlene also has received many honors, among them the George Foster Peabody Broadcast Award for Excellence for her work on Apartheid's People, a news hour series about la life in contemporary Africa. In 1990, she received the Sidney Hillman Award for a six-part series called Out of Reach, People at the Bottom. Charlene Hunter first came to our attention in 1961 as a 19-year-old seeking to be the first black woman admitted to the University of Georgia. Alice Walker, a native of Georgia and one of the, for, one of the most foremost contemporary American writers, in a piece for the New York Times Magazine in August 1973, was recalling a time in her childhood when Charlene Hunter and a young man named Hamilton Holmes were, the first, were first seen trying to enter the University of Georgia. Some people were stunned that they wanted to go to that white folks' school, but Alice soon saw Hamp and Charlene as the heroes they were. I had watched them every afternoon on the news when I came home from school, she wrote. Their daring 
was infectious. In June 1961, for a published publication called The Urbanite, Charlene wrote of her own experience in integrating the university, and she concluded the story this way. Maybe I am poorly qualified to predict what tomorrow will be like, a tomorrow made up of days which may be weeks, months, and even years in coming, when Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes will be forgotten, except by those who have come to know them as classmates or as friends. But tomorrow, when some of the problems which complicate living together for human beings in Georgia and the nation have faded into the background, not one, not two, but many Negro students will be able to walk through a Georgia corridor unnoticed except for their abilities or the impact of their individual personalities. Prophetic, to be sure, but not forgotten as attested by more than three decades of exemplary journalism. Charlene Hunter Galt will deliver the second of the Macmillan Stewart Lectures, New Nations Out of Old. Please welcome her. Before Charlene starts, um, uh, Bill and Bryce, I, w I want everybody and Laura, everybody in the back to come down and fill up these big places here. Please, thank you. And that way, stragglers coming in, we have plenty of room down there. We'll have uh, uh, a place to, to sit. And Audrey, we're, we're having a reception. Audrey, where's the reception? Okay, the reception um, following, after Charlene's talk, we'll have a few questions. And then you can join us for good food and drink um, back at the, the Barker Center. Okay? You all have a number over there? Not make these guys. Bill, can you move over a little bit? You're all stretched up over here. You're like this on the Sunday school teacher or something. <laughs> all right, everybody comfortable? All right, now let's welcome Charlene Hunter. Go one more time. I made it successfully through yesterday's talk, even though I was a little bit nervous. <laughs> so I think that's why Skip had the things had to say the, the same things he said this this afternoon. Um, the introduction helped a lot. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> but I still feel a little bit like that African lion who woke up early one morning in the jungle and he was feeling a little bit insecure. So he walks down a jungle path and the first animal he encounters is a little bush monkey. So he says to the little bush monkey, he actually sort of roars it, who is the king of the jungle? So the little bush monkey is terrified because there is the king of the jungle who is a lot bigger than he is. So he says, well you are, Mr. Lion, you are. That made the lion feel very confident. So he picks up a little, you know, bounce in his stride and continues on down the jungle path until he encounters a, a baboon. It's a little bit bigger than a bush monkey, for those of you who haven't been in Africa. <laughs> so he says, who is the king of the jungle? And the baboon roars back, well, you, oh, mighty lion. So that makes the lion feel even better so he's feeling even less insecure now he's feeling a little more like the king of the jungle so he walks on down the jungle path until he gets to an elephant and he roars up at the elephant now feeling quite confident and says who is the king of the jungle and the elephant takes one step back and unfurls his trunk and grabs the lion in it and hurls him down the garden path the jungle path. So the elephant, uh, the, the lion, you know, shakes himself and tries to figure out what just happened. <laughs> so he gets up slowly and he walks back up to the elephant and he said, now I know that you know that I am king of the jungle but after what just happened, I just want to know, why are you so agitated about it? 
So Skip, I'm not going to try to take your job or anything because you are definitely king of this jungle. <laughs> But I am going to try to uh, earn my board <laughs> for the next few days. Um, I want to talk today a little bit about, I tried to give a little bit of an introduction yesterday to what I would be talking about over the next couple of days. And we started with the specific. We started with a discussion of what I think of as a real miracle in South Africa, the country where Yusuf and I live. And I thank Yusuf for coming because like he, like probably many of you, are in the middle of exams. So that makes me feel like King of the Jungle, too. Um, and today I want to move a little bit beyond um, the South Africa miracle, which is kind of a unique uh, story on the continent. But there are many other things happening on the continent that could be classified as unique, but I have decided in my typical journalistic fashion to try to give it a sexy title and call it New News mm -hmm. Out of Africa, Baby Steps Towards Democracy. I think if ever there was a time uh, appropriate to quote Pliny the Elder on Africa, it's now. There is always something new out of Africa, he once wrote, which gave Isaac Dennison the title of her book about her years in Kenya that became a movie in 1985. But what is new out of Africa today is the stuff not of the silver screen, but of what I call new news, not the stuff that fueled the Afro-pessimism of Washington Post reporter Keith Richburg, among others, the genocide, the conflict, the chaos and disaster scenarios, or even the stuff of the Afro-realists like Madeleine Albright, the former Secretary of State, who was certainly a friend of Africa. She, along with many members of the Clinton administration, made many, many trips uh, to the continent. But there are new realities now, even since Albright's trips. New winds and words of change blowing through the continent. And they hold out what I think is the promise of the most dramatic developments in Africa since the end of colonial rule beginning some 40 years ago when the Gold Coast became Ghana, leading the flood of independent nations that followed. From Nigerian elections to the trial, conviction, and sentencing of Winnie Medikizela Mandela, still known among many in South Africa as the mother of the nation, her sentencing um, indicates that there is new news out of Africa. Nigeria, Africa's most populous country, held its first civilian-run elections in 20 years. 65 and a half million Nigerians voted. New news already as this goes totally against the trends in the rest of the international community. The poll was closely watched both on the continent and abroad, given Nigeria's position as one of the pillars of the continent-wide effort to help make this the African century. Along with the leaders of South Africa, Algeria, and Senegal, Nigeria's Olushigan Obasanjo has traversed the globe promoting Africa's homegrown remedy for its homegrown problems, a new deal to end the marginalization of Africa, in Mbeki's words. The ambitious plan would call on Africans to usher in a period of an era, in fact, of good political and economic governance, respect for human rights, and an end to its raging conflicts in exchange for increased Western investment and aid. The centerpiece of the project, I have some problems with the somewhat inartful name. I wish they could have been a little sexier about it, but they seem happy with it. It's called NEPAD. Some people pronounce it NEPAD, but the image is just too much. <laughs> In more ways than one, Nigeria was being watched because it qualifies as a veritable laboratory for the testing of the African remedy. It's the world's sixth largest oil producer, and yet endemic corruption has kept most Nigerians in poverty 
with two-thirds of its estimated 130 million people living on less than one dollar a day, according to World Bank statistics. Obasanjo, a former military ruler, was widely applauded when he handed over power to a freely elected successor in 1997. He earned more respect when he was jailed as a political prisoner during the murderous reign and terror of the late military dictator General Sonny Abacha. During his first term, Obasanjo, and I quote, reinvented himself as a popular elected, popularly elected civilian president, as The Economist recently put it. But Nigeria's problems multiplied, not least violence in both the North where some states have imposed Islamic law, meeting out harsh punishments, including death by stoning of women for having sex outside marriage. There's one case that's pending. We don't know what's going to happen. But a young woman was given a reprise in order to nurse her infant child. The child is now weaned. And there's been an erroneous... Uh, email going around saying that the stoning would take place on June 3rd. We're given to believe that this is not the case at this point, but that case is still pending. You may also recall that the Miss World pageant had to be moved from Nigeria because of a newspaper article, albeit insensitive and ill-considered. Uh, it was a, an article wondering what what inclinations the Prophet Muhammad might have towards any one of the Miss World uh, contestants. <laughs> At any rate, it could have been a laugh, but in Nigeria it led to a violent upheaval and over 100 deaths. And the young woman who wrote the article is now living in fear in exile. I don't know if the fatwa is still uh, in effect, but there was a, um, a decree handed down um, that, that she would be uh, killed. Moreover, in the south of Nigeria, there's been continuing violence over efforts by local populations to gain equitable shares of the oil wealth. In the past two years, some 10,000 people are reported to have died all over uh, in Nigeria. Like the country itself, the recent poll that brought Obasanjo back to power was robust and raucous. Nigeria happens to be one of my favorite countries, but it takes a lot of energy to be there. The loser in the presidential contest called it a massive and state-organized rape of democracy. Among others, U.S.-based observers like Christopher Fumunio, who lead, led the National Democratic Institute's team, said that the number of gross irregularities overshadowed the confidence of some Nigerian voters about the credibility of the electoral outcome. People died in this exercise as well. Yet Obasan Joe's Renaissance partner, Tabo Mbeki, along with Nelson Mandela and the Secretary General of the Commonwealth of Nations, Don McKinnon, who's been so hard on Zimbabwe, joined other notables in praising the success of Nigeria's elections, with Mbeki arguing that there are established judicial mechanisms in the country to hear any complaints arising out of the elections. And Obasanjo invited the details of any shortcomings to uh, enable any corrections and the right lessons to be learned for future use, adding, uh, this is very good, so pay attention. No human activity can be regarded as perfect because perfection can only be found with God. Grumbling and griping, but no coup d'etat. So that is new news out of Africa. There is urgency to Nigeria's recovery as the continent itself stands on a knife's edge, worried that the new bargain it is trying to strike with the West may be... Um, fading in part because of still another casualty of the Iraq war, as still another casualty of the Iraq war. In just a few days time the G8 group of Western nations will be meeting and South African President Mbeki, Mr. Nepad Man I once called him, uh, will need all the help he can get to persuade a distracted West that the bargain they made is worth keeping. Urgent moves are being made to put in place a group of eminent African persons to carry out the critical ingredients of the African home remedy, the peer review.
in which African states agreed to submit to a review of their political governance as a part of that new deal with the West. Many say that Western nations have made it clear in their African plan, African action plan, that support to NEPAD those will be determined by those countries that best performed in the peer review. So far, only 10 countries, or I guess it could be a glass half empty, glass half full thing, because 10 countries have signed up, but that's 10 out of 48. They are Algeria, the Republic of Congo Brazzaville, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Mozambique, Rwanda, South Africa, Uganda, and Nigeria. Meanwhile, peaceful elections have taken place in 42 of the 48 countries in sub-Saharan Africa since 1990, including Sierra Leone, where once the punishment for voting against those in power was having your limbs cut off. Lesotho has also um, had peaceful elections, having been bruised by an attempted coup in 1998. A historic poll in Kenya saw Daniel Arab Moy peacefully hand over the reins he held so tightly in his control for 24 years, the first change in power since independence in 1963. Following which, Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni announced his country will soon hold its first multi-party elections. Until now, Museveni, took, who took power in 1986, has defended his ban on political parties in, which he, in what he calls a no-party state, arguing that ethnic, tribal, and religious divisions are likely to be exacerbated by partisan political activity. When asked recently if all these peaceful transitions mean breaking the African pattern of the opposition crying foul or worse, uh, staging coup d'etat is over, Fumunyo of the NDI responded this way. He said, I don't think what you describe as an African pattern as such. I am fully aware of contested electoral outcomes on the continent, but increasingly in such countries as Mali, Senegal, Ghana, South Africa, and recently Kenya, we have seen elections won fair and square, in which losing candidates accept defeat and congratulate the victors. Hopefully this new pattern will become more commonplace as more and more competed, committed Democrats compete for elections. Elected, elective office in Africa. But the question is at this point just how many committed Democrats there are on the continent. When the new African Union was launched last year replacing the 39 year old Organization of African Unity, one of the notable naysayers to the new African remedy was Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi who expressed skepticism if not contempt for its prescription for Western aid, calling it a tool for blackmail and exploitation. I met the inscrutable Muammar Gaddafi. <laughs> I was invited to interview him uh, in a large tent that he had had flown in from Libya to Durban, South Africa, where he entertained heads of state and other guests said he felt more comfortable in the tent than in some of the fancy houses where some of the other dignitaries were staying. He told me in my, dare I say, exclusive interview, <laughs> it was exclusive, that the majority of African leaders, most of whom like him, did not lead democratic governments, agreed with him about the the deal that that Mbeki and the others were trying to strike. He said, if the terms of assistance are coupled with political aspects like good governance and the democracy or human rights, then this is considered to be an insult and will not be accepted. Gaddafi has since been quiet on the subject, but there are glaring examples that pose problems to Mbeki and those of like mind, most notably Zimbabwe, a kind of test case for the new African insistence on African solutions to African problems. Zimbabwe's elections of 2001 are still being contested amid growing and brutal repression by police and other agents of the state.
suppressions of the media and civil dissent, and an economic crisis that has seen the country once hailed as the continent's breadbasket to it now being called the continent's basket case. Largely the result of a combination of drought combined with the country's controversial land reform program that led to a massive white farmer exodus and the collapse of the commercial farming sector. As a result, I mean, many people have focused on the exodus of the white uh, farmers, but um, most of them had the money to get out, which is not to say that it's a good thing that they got forced out. But the real uh, people who are suffering now are the hundreds of thousands of farm laborers who are no longer employed and are dependent on international aid agencies for the food they used to grow and eat. I myself witnessed one day while covering the cricket some 11,000, that's 11,000, that's farther than the eye can see, 11,000 people in one feeding location where half-starved mothers carrying babies on their backs joined others in hours-long tracks in the heat of the day to get the rations of maize and cooking oil that they said would last them at best two weeks. After that, they get on by whatever is left on their very dry and parched land. Down the road from this feeding center, on my way back to Cricket, I stopped to talk with a farmer who was waiting for his wife's return from the feeding center. He told me that his field of green corn had no chance of maturing due to the drought, which had claimed his crop for three seasons in a row. When I asked him how he got by once the food aid ran out, he reached down into the tall grass where we were standing and pulled up a handful. We boil this, he said. This is how we survive. Some seven million Zimbabweans are getting by this way, and aid agencies say the numbers are growing. Some of this can, as I said earlier, be laid at the feet of Mother Nature, who visits periodically, bringing drought. But many say the scale of this crisis is not the result of mother, but of man. Economic policies leading to an inflation rate of more than 200 percent, with Zimbabwe having virtually no foreign currency. Nobody can travel outside of the country because they can't get any money to leave. And since I was there in February covering the Cricket Cup, the only way I could get the credentials, as you heard earlier, to get in, the embattled president has admitted for the first time that his regime is in crisis. Instead of celebrating 23 years of independence from British colonial rule last month, many Zimbabweans were mourning the death of democracy. Joining two other, two of the young cricketers, I actually did cover some cricket. I covered the two young cricketers who wore black armbands during their fixtures, mourning, in their words, the death of democracy. And neither of them feels comfortable enough now to live in Zimbabwe. A few days ago, I interviewed several young men who told me that they had trained, in their words, as Talibans for Mugabe. They were lured by the promise of food to feed their families, also suffering from hunger, lured into committing heinous crimes of murder, rape, destruction of property, and other abuses of the opposition. They were part of a force called the Green Bombers, whom the state says are youth militia training to do their national service and to help Zimbabwe get back on its feet. The state denies that they were trained to intimidate and kill its political opponents, but their stories are compelling. Consistent with many of the other testimonies I have taken where I have seen the electric shock marks on the bodies of the people who said they were tortured and other signs of torture. And I have confirmed with doctors in hospitals in Harare in particular who say that they have treated many of these victims and that such torturous abuse is widespread. Concurring and citing other abuses that include state suppression of the media, which it says, quote, has never been worse. Amnesty International has called on the government of Zimbabwe to issue invitations to the United Nations, to the special rapporteurs on freedom of opinion and expression and on torture, and the special representative of the UN Secretary General on human rights defenders. South Africa has been widely criticized for its policy of quiet diplomacy or constructive engagement with the Mugabe regime. 
but its leadership and others have adamantly rejected any kind of U.S. style regime change. For a while, South African officials have been playing good cop, bad cop out of its foreign affairs mouth. It insists that it would never ever abandon Zimbabwe, which many read as meaning the ruling ZANU PF party, at the same time stressing the need for observing the law and respect for human rights. South Africa has even been credited with getting Zimbabwe to release, to, to, um, re, re, to, to release some of the um, media restrictions which local and international journalists have labeled as draconian. Uh, just as I was coming here, the uh, Zimbabwean High Court uh, struck down one aspect of those restrictions, but most of them are still in place. Within the past few weeks, three African presidents, Mbeki of South Africa, Obasanjo of Nigeria, and Malusi of Malawi, traveled to Zimbabwe among much press speculation that they were going to get some kind of deal in which Mugabe would have a graceful exit strategy, making way for a transitional government that would run the country until new elections are held. The prognosticators had seized in part on an interview that Mugabe had given state television hinting that he might step down before the end of his six-year term in 2008. Publicly, the three leaders were saying that their visit was aimed at starting a dialogue between Mugabe and opposition leader Morgan Changarai, whose party has up to now refused to accept the legitimacy of the Mugabe government, arguing, as did many international observers, that the 2002 election was rigged, flawed to the point of illegitimacy. They are also seeking to have the Zimbabwe courts declare the election null and void. More media speculation. The impasse is over resignation and recognition. Which comes first, the resignation chicken or the recognition egg? But Mbeki attacked the reports as being from people insisting on imposing their own agendas on the other leaders, pretending to know everything and raising unjustified expectations that reflected their wishes. Well, I almost went for one of those analyses myself because it was on the front page of a newspaper and it sounded pretty authoritative and I just wished that I had the sources that he had. But now Mbeki is saying that was a crock. Instead, Mbeki insisted that they have no divine right to dictate to the people of Zimbabwe, adding, they seem to believe that if we issued some instructions to the political leaders of Zimbabwe as determined by themselves, obey what the boss across the Limpopo would have told them. But he says our own experience as a movement tells us unequivocally that no lasting solution to the challenges that face Zimbabwe can be found unless that solution comes from the people of Zimbabwe themselves. And it's interesting when these leaders, especially like Mbeki, refer to their own experience with liberation movements because a lot of people seem to think that it is this history that, um, that is the explanation for the way in which, or the gingerly way in which um, South Africa in particular has responded to the Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe crisis. There are others who say that um, the government of South Africa, and Mbeki in particular, that they that it is that they are terrified of what could happen if Zimbabwe um, implodes because of the impact that it could have on South Africa. Because already there seem to be almost as many <coughs> Zimbabweans in South Africa as there are in Zimbabwe. That's not quite true, but not nearly true. But it's a nice figure of speech. Um, but anyway, there, there will be massive problems in both countries um, if the situation continues as it is. These and other comments made by Mbeki in the wake of the Troika meeting provide more than just a window into his thinking, but also into the complexities of addressing new problems the African way, especially those arising out of old realities. For few African leaders, including Mbeki, take issue with Mugabe's decision to aggressively act on land redistribution, though a few, and a very few at that, have taken issue with the violent way, at least public issue, with the violent way in which most of it has been carried, it out, carried out. But even as recently as this past weekend, in his weekly online newsletter, 
and Becky was defending Zimbabwe, arguing that the economic crisis affecting Zimbabwe did not originate from the desperate actions of a reckless political leadership or from corruption, that it arose from genuine concern to meet the needs of the black poor without taking into account the harsh economic reality that in the end we must pay for what we consume. And Becky acknowledges the dire economic crisis that has followed in Zimbabwe and allows that Zimbabweans will have to make serious sacrifices and take a lot of pain, insisting that the longer the problems of Zimbabwe remain unresolved, the more entrenched poverty will become, leading to greater social instability as the poor try to respond to the pains of hunger. But even on the issue of lawlessness, and Becky treads very softly. The state, he said, will inevitably have to emphasize issues of law and order, even as it has fewer means to address the needs of the people. And then he cushions that with these words, none of this will happen because they are demonic people in Harare harboring evil hearts with no concern other than the exercise of power and the personal enjoyment of its benefits. The internal logic of various processes in human society compel all of us to be carried along by events to destinations we may not have sought. That will not please the members of the opposition party or others who are unhappy with what they see as demonic people in Harare harboring evil hearts because there is a background of arrest of opposition leaders en masse, recently removal of the mayor of Harare, a member of the opposition, on charges of corruption, having been detained and tortured early, earlier for just simply having a meeting with his constituents in public. And a widely respected Zimbabwean human rights group recently reported the highest number of illegal arrests and torture in the last three years, which means, among other things, that the Zimbabwean people are attempting to do for themselves what others are failing to do, that they themselves are attempting to redress the serious social, economic, and political problems facing the country. Two recent mass stayaways organized by the labor movement have been highly successful and hold out the promise of more. The question is, will their efforts lead to more repression and a greater negative image of the country outside, especially among Western donors? And how will that affect the willingness of Western donors to come to the party? Likewise, also close to home, the Swaziland example, one of the last absolute monarchies in the world where the King of Swati has asserted custom and tradition in the face of a small but growing pro-democracy pro force in the tiny mountain kingdom. In one of the most extraordinary, in fact, unprecedented challenges to the monarchy recently, a mother took the king to court over what she says was the abduction of her daughter. Now, I don't know how many of you know how the king chooses his wives, but once a year they have something called the reed dance, and all these young bare-chested girls dance in front of the king, and he picks one to be his next wife. And this one, uh, the mother said, was abducted. She wasn't actually in the reed dance. She accompanied one of her friends to the reed dance. And the mother claims that the king abducted her off of the street. <laughs> the king insisted there was no abduction, that taking the woman's 18-year-old daughter into the royal house with the intention of making her he his 11th wife was his right. In the end, with the young woman's appearance in public with the other ten wives signaling a fait accompli, the mother all but bowed out of the court proceedings, asking for an indefinite postponement. But the move was not before the case drew the attention of the treatment of the rights of women who were regarded in Swaziland as minors in general and minors in particular with women groups, women's groups joining unions and others insisting it's time to challenge custom that violates human rights. That's new news out of Africa. The case was the opening wedge in what is fast becoming a major crisis for the monarchy as the entire Court of Appeals resigned en masse in December. 
followed later by the Chief Justice who had heard the case of the mother's challenge. In his resignation, the Chief Justice cited government's ongoing defiance of court orders. The Director of Public Prosecutions also resigned on similar grounds. A report by the in International Bar Association critical of the monarchy's draconian powers that have all but destroyed this judicial system was taken into the streets and burned by government officials who had invited them in in the first place by the way and the young king M. Swati told his subjects recently that although the world is preaching democracy it does not mean we have to follow them dismissing democracy as a fad said the king, democracy is not good for us. They love calling on God these days. Democracy is not good for us because God gave us our way of doing things as in the divine right of kings. And Becky was pressed about this right next door in his backyard uh, recently at an editor's conference and promised that the proper regional authorities would look into the complaints. Still, with these and other problems beyond his immediate neighborhood, Talbo and Becky might well take a page out of the book of South African poet Wally Sirotti, telling, if not convincing the world, quote, this is not just a sad tale and must not be. And Becky has a success of the Democratic Republic of the Congo is a case on the credit side of the ledger, though I would hesitate at this point to use the word concrete, which suggests set in stone. A piece of just a few months is still too fragile for that. But if what has happened and what is happening in the DRC can be accurately described as peace, with all outside forces having left and internal forces, parties agreeing to power sharing interim government that will govern until elections are held possibly in two years' time. Largely through the force of dogged determination and will over a period of many, many months, South Africa hosted, wrangled, cajoled, threatened, sweet talked paid for a lot of room service, and finally persuaded what they refer to as the role players and the stakeholders to agree to a deal that hopefully signals the end of the DRC conflict. It's war having drawn in six neighboring countries, leading among others then Assistant Secretary of State Susan Rice to warn of the possibility of Africa's first world war. By the time the deal was signed last December, the war had claimed more than two million lives, mostly innocent civilians scattered across a country of 50 million, the size of Western Europe. But if all goes according to plan, the country's first election since independence will take place again in about two years, giving voice to a devastated people who have had no say in their own destiny for 30 years. And for that, the West now insisting that Africa deal with African problems, need factor in its own culpability in the legacy of the Congo, among others. For the Congo was part of the African territory the West used as a bulwark against communism in the contest for global dominion, and as such propped up, supported, and gave free reign to the man who is largely responsible for the condition of the Congo today, having robbed his rich nation blind while brutally suppressing his people and declaring democracy is not for Africa. As my good friend Lynn Duke wrote in her recent book, which I commend to your bookshelves, Mandela, Mobutu, and me, he was a classic African big man, an autocrat, some would say a megalomaniac, but definitely a grandiose figure who, like Louis XIV, the Sun King, believed, l'état c'est moi, I am the state. But all that rhetoric of nationhood, writes Lynn, turned out to be Mobutu's own prelude to the deal. Skimming off revenue from all money making state enterprises, he amassed wealth that analysts tallied in the region of four billion dollars. Much of it, though, he doled out over the years in the patronage that kept his family, entourage, close generals, and other political allies in line. Laurent Kabila, the successor who drove him from power with the help of neighbors Rwanda and Uganda, who eventually fell out with each other, proved to be no more of a statesman. And while it's too early to tell how his son and successor, young Joseph, will fare on history's report card, he has already shown himself to be light years ahead of the other two, having committed himself for now to this South African broker peace deal and to democracy. New news out of Africa. The Congo peace deal is a huge proof of their pudding, added to a string of democratic successes around the continent. But democratic 
progress must be measured in more than elections. And for this, I return to South Africa by way of example. During a review I did of the continent's democratic pro process at the end of the century, as the U.S. was still debating the results of the Bush election and its problems in Miami in particular, South Africa's foreign minister told me, we've seen one of the older democ democracies in the United States when all fails in the country of votes or dimples, this or the other institution had to come in and resolve the impasse. So it's important to have democratic institutions that support the democratic process. To that end, South Africa has said it would be using two covert slush funds it had discovered from the apartheid era to strengthen emerging democracies. The urgency, though, is driven not only by the need to convince the West, but also by a driving need to convince Africans themselves of what's being called the democracy dividend. Some 65% of Africans join Nigerians in living on less than a dollar a day. 40% don't even attend primary school, and much of the continent's wealth has flown the coop. Tanzanian President Benjamin Nkapa told me not long ago that it was one thing to call on people to make sacrifices, for example, as countries like his tried to get their economic house in order through internationally devised structural adjustment programs. People already enduring hardships were asked to endure more and have endured more. But, he told me, at some point, the people's patience will wear thin. And if democracy can't deliver, they'll look elsewhere. Some possibly to anarchy, some to terrorism. I've been struck by reading in books like Jane Corbin's The Base. Have you read that one, Skip? It's an amazing book. It's, it's, it's a stunningly comprehensive account of the creation and the evolution of Al-Qaeda, coupled with testimonies that I've taken myself, how utterly potentially exploitable by terrorists, criminals, and others are the poor and the alienated. How it only takes a handful of zealots to secure, to seduce those whose only ideology is an empty stomach. I have already spoken of the Zimbabwe experience. And while I would venture to say that the vast majority of people living on the continent are peace-loving and law-abiding, desperation has a way of blurring distinctions between good and evil. Criminals, terrorists, corrupt leaders know this and are poised, if not actively engaged, in exploiting this unhappy reality. A New York Times report on democratization on the continent quoted an Afrobarometer survey of public opinion conducted in 12 African countries, coordinated by professors in South Africa, Ghana, and the United States, detailing the opinions of 80% of its respondents saying that democracy should deliver jobs, access to education, with nearly half saying their living standards were getting worse under democracy. The Times report also cited the World Bank estimation estimation of per capita income in sub-Saharan Africa, about $474 a year, saying it is less today than it was at the end of the 1960s. Yet the same Times report reported 70 percent of the respondents said democracy was always preferable to non-democratic forms of government. Ibrahim Gambari, the United Nations Special Representative for Africa and a Nigerian, aren't they all? <laughs> told reporters there are 17, still 17 ongoing conflicts. Africa is still the poorest continent in the world, the biggest sufferer of HIV and AIDS, the continent with the most external debt and the least foreign investment. But we are a lot more hopeful than we were five or ten years ago. In a recent speech at the opening of the Africa Conference on Elections, Democracy and Governance held in Pretoria, Thabo and Becky raised this question. Does the fact that we are Africans make, it, make us prone to the anti-democratic violence conveyed by Africa's history of violent conflicts? Or was it simply that we were not sufficiently educated to understand and implement the democracy rule book? He then goes on to quote South African writer and analyst Colin Legum. The African dream of a golden age has withered on the tender vine of independence, and it became clear that Africa was not going to escape the experience of Europe, the Americas, and Asia in comparable historical periods when they were evolving and consolidating their new nation states. Many of the factors which destroyed the optimism of the period of romanticism in Africa were not very different from those in Europe, which had experienced its Hundred Years' War, Napoleonic conquests, assassinations, time of chaos.
It was similar, too, in the Americas, with the fratricidal killings and the bitterness of the American Civil War the racism of slavery, the corruption and miseries of the Reconstruction years, and in Latin America where a succession of wars was fought over the shaping of orders, the rise of dictators and military regimes, oppression, and widespread abuses of the human rights of the indigenous populations, and the failure of Simon Bolivar's ambition to unify Latin America. The wars and revolutions in Europe and the Americas exceeded in scale and casualties the violent episodes in Africa bad as they were. A context often forgotten by those who would judge Africa today. At the same time, and Becky warned, our own history tells us that we must not do today what we did in the past. And what many, many are calling a sign of the growing maturity of his own country's democracy, a court recently found Winnie Medicazella Mandela guilty of fraud and theft and sentenced her to five years in jail, although the judge's order allows her to satisfy her sentence by serving eight months in jail and the rest performing community service under court supervision. It was not the first time that Winnie Medicazella Mandela had been found guilty of a crime, one more serious than this one, involving the kidnapping and murder of a 14-year-old during the intense activism of the final days of apartheid. Despite this conviction in that case, she was given a suspended sentence, owing to her role as the voice of Mandela and largely of the struggle during the, much of his 27 years in prison. They also took into account her own suffering, having been twice imprisoned, once in solitary confinement for a year. She had also been banished to a remote, barren place with her two small daughters, allowing only one visitor at a time. During the sentencing in this case, both the prosecutor and the judge spoke in terms of South Africa's new democracy and the role Winnie Medicella Mandela played in helping to bring it about. The prosecutor even arguing that it was questionable how such a new society in the making would feel about it, as he put it, an elderly great-grandmother being in prison for any term. I worry about elderly great-grandmother. <laughs> She's only four years older than me. <laughs> but despite the fact that the prosecutor argued for community service, the judge insisted that Medica Zella Mandela serve at least one-sixth of her five-year sentence, or eight months, arguing, we live in a new disp dispensation where we expect those who make the law should uphold the law. Needless to say, the matter has stirred strong emotions and intense debate, not to mention big headlines and reams of newspaper copy. Some supporters immediately cried racism as the sentencing judge was white and had been on the bench during apartheid. Most, however, including the ruling African National Congress, did not go that way, accepting that justice had been done. Many, in fact, even her own neighbors, and many women, in fact, and admirers, insisted that what Madhika Zella Mandela needed rather than jail was psychological help, her, her psyche having been damaged in ways that few of us could imagine, and with little or no such support along the way. She's also reported to be destitute. At any rate, um, Medica Zella Mandela is insisting on her innocence and her co-accused, she and her co-accused are appealing the sentence. The debate over how best to handle an icon like Winnie Medica Zella Mandela when in the judge's words somewhere something went wrong is not likely to end soon nor is the one over a judiciary that remains largely white even among those who do not think this decision or the judge himself was racist. But what is significant here is that a demo is, is there is democratic space in which to have the sentence and the debate, and maybe even as some are advocating the pardon of a fallen icon. All of which bolsters of Becky and other leaders who believe the democratic strides the continent are making deserve concrete action from the West. American professor John Strimlaw, now heading the School of International Affairs at the University of the Viswatersrand, argues that Africans need the same kind of help, cooperation, and encouragement the U.S. gave to building democracy in Europe after the Second World War, and that the phrase African solutions for African problems should not be used as a cop-out for the rest of the world to do nothing.
The guarded optimism that leaders like Mbeki expressed after the last meeting with the G8 leaders, however, has turned, as I indicated earlier, to worry over how Africa will fare in the post-Iraq world, not just in terms of economic aid, but also in the engagement of the West in helping to resolve conflicts. Recently, my CNN colleague in Kenya, Catherine Bond, reported that regional analysts and others are worried about the bad situations growing worse in Burundi and also in Sudan where American attention was absolutely key for the peace process to make progress. Burundi has just had a peaceful transition from Tutsi-led government to Hutu, but real battles are still raging in the countryside. Bon also reported that already refugee populations are going hungry. Corn rations to half a million Burundians in Tanzania have been halved, and the World Food Program is saying it doesn't have enough food aid for refugees in Uganda, Sudan, or Kenya, adding more than 8,000 refugee children in Kenya are malnourished, as they are in most of the war-torn countries on the continent. I was just in Angola the other day, and 45% of the children in that country are malnourished as a result of the 30 years war that just ended. Neither the children of Africa nor its young democracies will flourish if they are chronically malnourished. The nurturing of these children and of the new democracies and of the ideas that are being debated towards that end all add up, in my view, to something new out of Africa. New news. Thank you. Most of the countries now, the movements don't have to be underground. They can be above ground, and that's a real step forward. It's a baby step, but it's a big step in a way. It's not a giant step, but it's a big step. And, and so the civil society is becoming increasingly more active. But yesterday I talked about South Africa. And in fact, I just picked up today's New Yorker. And on the, uh, there's a um, front page, um, uh, what do you call it, the cover page um, thing on um, Story Inside about Zaki Ahmad, who is the leader of the Treatment Action Campaign, which is the AIDS, AIDS organization. And um, I like to think they stole this idea from me. Uh, <laughs> Well, we've been following Zaki and, and his movement for a long time. And my own view, as I expressed yesterday, was that the AIDS uh, movements have managed to do something that few of the other civil society movements have, have been able to do since the end of apartheid. They've been able to galvanize and, and uh, people mobilize and also attract funds. Many of the funds that went into the anti-apartheid movement left once apartheid ended even though clearly there was a greater need then than ever. So the groups like the Landless People, People's Movements and, 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 and other rights groups are struggling to find the kind of support they need to get their messages out. The, the AIDS people have just been extraordinarily, extraordinarily successful at that. And in other places, I mean, you know, one of the things Skip told me I had to do 26 double-spaced typewritten pages, and that was it. <laughs> so I couldn't in this one get into, um, you know, the, 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 there is a whole nother layer, which you've just gotten to, of civil society activism that, that's starting to build. Um, in fact, I was just reading on the Internet um, the, the civil society organizations in Nigeria's comments on, on the election and their dis, uh, dis, dis, dissatisfaction. Uh, with with the results, so so that there's movement all over the continent, and you know even uh, about uh, 
about three weeks ago, editors uh, from around the continent came to South Africa uh, to, to meet. I mean, it, it, what is simply amazing about some of this, be because of this change uh, in, in the, the expansion of the space that people have uh, to move freely in, more or less, um, th these editors had never gotten together on the continent before. I mean, this was an extraordinary thing. And they didn't always agree, and the Nigerians, you know, tend to dominate things, and now they got the South Africans on the South End trying to dominate things. But they're just getting to know one another, and it's amazing to just be a fly on the wall and watch. I mean, somebody called on me to make a comment, and I said, no, no, no. You know, because this was a clearly an African thing, and it was amazing to see this synergy uh, start to develop. And, and, and by the time it was over, you know, they, they had made some concrete proposals, but the most important thing about this conference was that they were getting to know each other for the first time. So there is a lot of, and, and then the criticism, for example, of NEPAD, I didn't have an opportunity to really get into that, but... Um, you know, civil society on the, on the continent has been very concerned about what they see as a lack of transparency in, in this coming up with this homegrown remedy that they didn't have input. So they're just having little conferences here and there and everywhere about how they, when and where they enter into this process. Um, and, and so, and, and you know, in, in most of the countries on the continent, I'll talk about this tomorrow, the government still controls the organs of communication. So it's difficult. But with, uh, and, and then, you know, things like computers and stuff, most people don't have individual ones, but there are Internet cafes all over the place now, and people are communicating one, with, with one another. So that there's a lot of movement now. Uh, even, even though you may not see it writ large, uh, but you know, in, in, in countries where there's been tremendous, I mean, there's no more repression anywhere than in Zimbabwe. Excuse me. And yet people are coming out. In the first uh, stay away they had, it was, it was this flop, huge flop. But in the next two, people came out, even in the face of uh, some terrible stuff. And I'm not saying the government's doing it. They're saying the government's doing it. But I know what the kids have told me. These young 16, 17, 18-year-olds who were telling me they were taught how to, you know, break somebody's neck. Uh, and he demonstrated it. And he told me who did it, who told them how to do it. And they don't have any reason to lie. I mean, they're in South Africa now. But even in the face of all that, you know, people are coming out. So a lot going on. Charlie, Every time I see you on CNN, you have a different place in Africa. Um, and then I, at some level, you have to be aware of this, that you know, you're making history. I mean, as a, you're certainly not the first African-American journalist to cover Africa. No, Keith Richburg was there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. It, well, it's amazing how, you know, one person with a negative view can affect the whole perception sure. of Tom the Johnson wrote about Africa for mm -hmm. the Times, you know, when, when a long time ago, long yeah. Time ago. But you certainly are the first African American woman who can, I mean, to be covering Africa and Africa is a beat, isn't it? Well, TV. Not TV. Okay. Yeah, because Lynn Duke, as I said, I commend her book, Mandela Mobutu and Me. Um, it's It's a very. You know, it's a very passionate account of her, I think about five years, covering mostly Southern Africa, but, you know, her, her to, to compare her um, accounts and Richburg's, I, I don't think it was just a, a gender thing, mm -hmm. although I think that gender is a factor mm -hmm. in how we react often to situations. I mean, I'll cry if, if I'm moved to cry. Sure. I might then have to go out and write that the woman lied or whatever, you know, I don't know. Or that I cried when she told me X. But I, but I think, you know, we, we, we don't feel that we have to be totally dispassionate in the face of some of the most unimaginable horror around. It's, it's, you, you wouldn't be human. Yeah, you, you can, yeah, and you can still be, um, so-called, I don't like the word objective because I don't think it's an accurate mm -hmm. word but for what we do. But, but I mean, we can still be fair. Right. Uh, but I think, you know, there are not a lot of uh, African Americans uh, covering the continent. There are not a lot of anybody covering the continent anymore. <laughs> um, you know, so we do what we can and we bring our perspectives.
uh, which I'll talk about tomorrow. That's tomorrow's lecture. So that's well, a little tease. Well, Come back. But my question is, that first was an observation. My question is, um, again, I mean, after being reborn, you know, 1960, 19 African nations become independent. And now it's been born all over again, right? So, and you're there at another historic moment. So Africa's being born the first time when you are integrating the University of Georgia, right? Literally. Mm -hmm. Then the second time, now you're covering it. Are you, it's a simple-minded question, but it's a necessary question. Sorry, it's what we think. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> are you we do this, don't worry about it. about the future of Africa and what would that mean? I mean, you know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, what's it going to look like? Well, you know, that's, that, that's a crystal ball I don't have. To, to look into, but what, what I will say about that is that, you know, I, I used to think that, that people who were witnesses to history were really old. Mm -hmm. Now, it's possible I've gotten really old and hadn't noticed, <laughs> <laughs> you know. but, but I am also aware, you know, in fact, when I was getting ready to work, work on these talks, I was, I was looking everywhere for someone who had been around uh, in Africa at independence so I could just talk to them to see if their um, if their emotional reactions were the same as mine now to see if there was as much excitement about uh, the end of c colonialization and the future as it is now about this not that that would necessarily be you know D determine where, where it was going to go, but just to help you have your own sort of balance there and and not to get too excited, you know. But I do think that there are some differences here. Uh, there's a lot more to work with now than there was then. You don't have these um, super superpowers mucking about on the continent. I mean, they may be doing it in different ways, but right now there's no. Uh, compelling rivalry uh, that would cause them to prop up bad people, except I'm a little bit worried about this Iraq thing, because there were people who got visited, for example, uh, leaders who got visited whose countries certainly are not democratic. And the Democrats and the would-be Democrats got really nervous because they said, okay, what kind of deal are they striking? But I think there's a lot more vigilance now, too, um, with, with things like that, and civil society and others more willing to speak out so that if some Democrat um, or non-Democrat suddenly is not being bothered about abusing human rights in his country or something, uh, pe people will speak out. Now, whether they can they're speaking out will have an impact, I don't know. Uh, but certainly they would, they would speak out. I mean, there are all kinds of rumors. I mean, the continent is, is um, you know, I was talking yesterday about Biko, uh, Steve Biko describing how um, Africans just love to talk. They just love to sit around and debate. And, and it's the communal, uh, the communal, uh, um, the communal nature of it, the closeness of it, that that promotes this, you see. Um, and they also like to, uh, I guess this is true anywhere, but when you're working in, in, in small environments, it's even more pronounced that, you know, the rumor mill is like the elixir of life. And so there are all kinds of rumors about deals that were made with people. And I won't repeat them because that would make me one of them, which I have pretty much become. <laughs> so I'd love to repeat it, but it's on tape. Uh, I'll do it at the uh, at the reception. Um, the the one the deals that I've heard about aren't as as bad as they might be because they're with. I mean, you know, like look at Museveni. Now Museveni is everybody's favorite uh, one-party state. President, leader, you know. I mean, nobody talks about how he got to be where he is because he's basically been, right? He's basically been a good leader. I mean, he did the best. He's done the best of anybody on AIDS on the continent. He just got right up at the top and called it what it was and just started because he saw his cabinet was dying. 
uh, the, 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 the people who were running the country were dying. He was losing his, his soldiers were dying. Everybody was dying. And he said, wait a minute, we've got to do something about this. And, and it's amazing. I've been there and, and from every level, interdepartmental, you know, business, the private sector, the government, the young people, they've got a radio program for, especially for young people to talk about AIDS. They've got clinics. I mean, they've just done, enormous work so so you know he's sort of everybody sort of looks the other way that it's not a democracy even though it functions pretty well giving not abusing people and stuff but people also say now analysts say that his recent announcement that Uganda is going to move to one multi-party democracy may be tied to NEPAD because if, if this is going to be the standard on the continent for people to put money into countries and everybody wants that money and everybody wants that investment, uh, then they're going to have to show something for it. So it'll be very interesting to follow this and be very interesting to see. I mean, people are quaking in their boots over Iraq, people in Africa, because this G8 thing, when it meets, uh, was it next week or week after, pretty soon, G June, where are we now? In, in, in the May, yeah, June 3rd, somewhere in June. Um, they're already talking about the reconstruction money that they're going to need to 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 don you know to raise donate and and provide for Iraq. Well, maybe there's enough money to go around, but maybe not. One one final question, and then we will uh, go back to the Barker Center for uh, food injury and rumors. And rumors. <laughs> and rumors. Uh, Evelyn Hammond, do you have your hand up? I can't wait to hear the rumors, so I'll try to, <laughs> yeah. I'll try to give a short answer. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the thing you haven't spoken about, does the United Nations have a presence in any of these efforts, or has it become... Um, well, the World, World Food Program is United Nations. I mean, they're providing a lot of uh, food assistance and co doing, much, doing the coordination, you know, on, on that level. But what I was leading to is that the ways in which I, I think you keep pointing to it that it could it could the the other thing the United Nations is doing is that they do have tr peacekeeping troops in places like Congo and and stuff but and you know it's the Africans who have been the most vehement on um, on uh, uh, not bypassing the United Nations I mean the Africans are still um, feeling very embittered about how uh, this thing went down. And I've, I've tried to report that because I think it's important. I mean, Africans, almost 99% were, were opposed to the way in which this, this uh, war was conducted and feel that, I mean, and this is black and white, and, um, you know, feel that A, it was illegal and uh, that the UN was ignored and um, you know many of them speak out of the memory of colonialism their own colonialism and they feel that this is is what that is I mean it's not my position I'm reflecting what uh, was said in every um, I mean even the media and I'll talk about I think I talk about this a little bit tomorrow I don't think I do actually it, but the media in Johanna in uh, South Africa were a hundred percent uh, against the war, and that, re and 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 even you know, normal, normally people who are very balanced in their uh, comment. There's one talk show host, Tim Odise, who's just gotten so many awards for his balance. I mean, people love him. Black, white, conservative, liberal, arch conservative, ultra liberal, and uh, Tim just tipped complete. I mean. He, he is so, such a good, I listen to him every single morning and I, and I, it, and it got so extreme. I finally had to go do a piece on, on this because I said this, this clearly is something extraordinary, uh, that he would, um, I mean, he, he would, he would, he would almost never let people who would call in to say, but don't you think the, I mean, 
he just wouldn't let him finish. And it wasn't anything to do with Saddam Hussein. I mean, they all thought he was a bad guy. It was, it was the principal. And, and, and you have this funny little situation now where, you know, the West and the Western leaders, the G8s and everybody are telling, telling Africans to, to set up your democ democracies and, and, and go that way and have your institutions and your conflict resolution and stop having your coup d'etats and do it in an orderly democratic fashion. And then at least the perception among them is, A, you're not listening to the rest of the world. You don't care about what we have to say. And then you're doing things that are non-democratic. Now, America's got to square that. Uh, if, if they expect to be the moral leader of the world, they, they've got to sort out these, these feelings that people have. Because it's not just five or ten people, it's countries. You know, now the Africans who, like in Becky, and Becky is among every, in everything else. He's a visionary, but he's also a pragmatist. So, you know, he, even he spoke out against the war. Mandela spoke out against the war. Tutu spoke out against the war. All of them spoke out against the war. But now, they've got to go in there and negotiate this contract. So it's going to be interesting. I mean, they probably won't say anything else about this, would be my guess. Uh, but the, they want to check. But the feelings are there. And, and I don't think this is going to go away anytime soon. What worries me the most, now when I went to the Sudan right after 9-11, I went there deliberately because this is a country on the list of terrorist states harboring terrorists and so forth. And they're trying to get off it too. Um, but I went there just because of that reputation. And I went to a university and I talked to these young Muslim women students who were so shy initially that they didn't even want to uh, talk. And then they would talk to me, just me, and then eventually we talked a little more and a little more and I got them to agree to talk on camera. And they were they went from being shy and demure and, you know, to, you know, just vehement in their attacks on American policy because of the treatment of the Palestinians. But then when I said, well, what about, does this extend to Americans? Oh, no. I'm talking about America. I mean, they were very clear making a distinction. In fact, they started to tell me about all the friends they have in America that they email with. You know, and they said, they, oh, we have friends in Miami, we have friends here. And it was like a whole different, fa and the faces changed, the demeanor changed, everything. But you switch back to American policy, and it's hard, hard, hard. Now, Tim said something interesting in Modise in South Africa, because I asked him the same question. And his answer was very tricky. He, well, it wasn't so tricky. He said, look, uh, Bush is the president. But Americans made him the president. So even though our antipathy is to Bush and his policies, he's an American, it's American policy, and by extension, Americans. And so they are going to begin at some point to feel this. And I personally haven't felt it. Um, you know, I mean, journalists tend to be sort of in a class by their own, but I've had more and more people trying to elicit from me my personal attitudes about this, which I don't give. I mean, regardless of how I feel about it or how strongly I might feel about it. I mean, that's what I talk about around my dinner table, but not out in the public. And um, so there is that, but there's not been the hostility. Uh, but I heard this morning on the news, which I think is being very irresponsible in this country. I mean, the things that they say could happen. Well, you know, this could mean when there's no indication whatsoever. Now this, and they don't give you any kind of, uh, um, um, you know, they don't tell you where they got this from. You know, they, they just say, uh, this is happening and this may be happening and blah, blah, blah. And one of the things they said was that there's a high alert on now because they are concerned about attacks in, and they named a couple of places, but then they named Africa. And I thought, oh no, not again. Because, you know, 9-11, a lot of people were killed in this country, but in, there's been uh, terrorist attacks in Kenya where more Africans were killed than Americans in two, country, in two, two cities, 
uh, in Kenya, and uh, you know, you know the the so so I, I mean I don't know where, and they didn't say. I mean they treat Africa like it's a country as opposed to a continent. So they said in Africa, like in Missouri. <laughs> So I don't I don't know where that could be, and I and I can't because I don't I mean it's it, it's even difficult for me to try and figure out where would terrorists strike in Africa, um, you know because there are many many Muslims on the continent, and um, and I think that there are countries where they would not want to destabilize the situation. Like I don't think they would make an attack in South Africa. I mean they could. But I don't think they would, um, because South Africa is. I mean, you do, and you automatically, you know, become. South, and anyway, that's too long to go into. But I don't know where that's going to happen. Um, I'm just, you know.